Welcome to those who are joining us. I'm Sharon Constanson of the South African Chamber of Commerce. And this is going to be a very interesting session. Um, as the chairman of the Chamber of Commerce, one of the things that we are passionate about is to stay uh, relevant and popular with the types of events that um, people need to um, expose themselves to. But more importantly, the areas where boards, companies, individuals need to be focusing on the new agenda, what is important for companies, sustainability being very, very critical for us. So the Chamber is running a series of events between now and COP26, of which this is the second in the series of the two different streams that we're doing, two or three different streams. First of the stream of four that we're going to be doing with the uh, University of the Free State in South Africa. So thank you very much for everyone for being with us. Really appreciate the attendance. Um, I'm going to, in a moment, just uh, introduce Prof. Francis Peterson. Um, Professor Francis William Peterson is the Rector and Vice-Chancellor of the University of the Free State and has been in that role for going on four years now. He's been um, Deputy Vice-Chancellor of the University of Cape Town, Dean of various other university, and uh, had various other roles, including Dean of a number of other academic uh, institutions, mainly in the Western Cape, from what I can see. He's also a non-executive director on the board of Fruits Unlimited, and former chairman uh, of the board of the Council of Scientific Industrial, what we know as CSIR. So, and he's also had an extensive experience of management at various levels within the university and industry, industry sectors. So a man who can talk from many levels, that of an academic, that from a university point of view, and that from a um, education point of view of those that um, are looking to, to step up in the space in, in life. So there are things that are very passionate to, I may call him Francis, he has given me that permission. Um, there are various things that are important to him. And let's start by asking him a question or two in that space. So the word global citizen could have many, many meanings, Francis. And obviously you have your very specific meaning. So to help our audience be in line with you, could you give us um, a quite short description of what is a global citizen? Uh, good afternoon, Sharon, and, and thank you for, for having me. Um, so when I, when I look at global citizen, I, I'm, I'm actually referring here to the individual, to a person. Uh, and in a university context, it will be a student, but it could be an employee if you work in a corporate uh, environment. And that is the understanding of that individual's view of the world. Uh, so being aware of what's going on, not only around the environment where you are, but the broader environment, and also to have uh, uh, an awareness of that. So that is, that is the understanding and the awareness of the wider world, and then try to bring it back to where you are, uh, and how you contextualize that. That would be in a very short descriptive of my understanding of global citizenship. Something has driven you to get you to this place, to be wanting to share this with the global world and with global students, and particularly with the students of the University of the Free State who are going to go global in many aspects of their lives and uh, are likely to take this message um, of the global citizen into a broader place. What got you to this place in the first place? Yeah. So, Sharon, again, for me, um, and I think COVID-19 have demonstrated that, again, about the interconnectedness of the world. But for me, it is about what we would like the world to look like, to be. And for me, the individuals, wherever they are, is going to be playing an ever-increasing and important role. And due to the fact that they would be able to interconnect and connect with other parts of the globe, towards imagining what the world should be and should look like. Um, that is the passion that drives me. And, and, and for me, there's a reimagination. There's a transformative thinking that needs to take place in the individual's mind and action, but also if you have a collective of individuals uh, uh, um, in an organization, how do you, in fact, utilize that energy, that thinking to be able to shape where you would like to go as this wonderful world, which I will talk a little bit later about. Thank you. I, I love that that you brought together of um, 
the the collective energy of the individual global citizens when they're operating in a corporate environment. I find that actually very powerful imagery for me. So thank you for sharing that. Um, one of the things that you've talked about is um, inheriting the concept of this citizenship, this global citizenship, is that of a loyalty and allegiance, um, behaviors of the individuals. Um, and you also talked a moment ago, and you rose, uh, you gave us a sort of insight into the word of COVID being a powerful disruptor in the life that we are in at the moment. And that has given us a, a stark reminder to actually really think about our own identity, where we are, who we are, what's important around us. And can you just give us a little bit more of what do we need to do as individuals to secure our long-term survival? Yes. So Sharon, I, I probably would like to take a step back and to say the world that I referred to a little bit earlier, uh, I, I would believe that most of citizens in the world and in the globe would think about a world that is fair, a world that is equitable, a world that is stable, uh, a world that exhibits social justice, um, and, 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 and a world that, that, that is prosper that does prosper. And those are the things that I think is important. And as a global citizen, that is what, what, what you would like to see. What COVID-19, in fact, brought to us was uh, not only a disruption in terms of our normal life, but it probably put for me two narratives on the table. Um, the one narrative is a narrative of um, nationalism, a narrative of protectionism, a narrative of, uh, I would say, countries that are protecting their own vulnerability. And there's nothing wrong with that. But that's the one narrative is on the table. And the other narrative is a narrative of solidarity, a narrative that we all as human beings are fragile. And I think COVID-19 have indicated that to us. And a narrative of collaboration and perhaps a narrative of co-creation. Now, that's the two the two one, the two narratives, and they are actually opposite one another. Uh, if you look look at it, and for me, if you take it further, if you look at the, you know, if I now have to look at the business part, uh, um, that a lot of, of 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 business and development have been accelerated, specifically in the area of technology, businesses that have been driven by the technology, practices that has been driven by technology, that have excelled tremendously. But on the other hand, um, the COVID-19 also have demonstrated fault lines in our society, where we're looking at poverty and inequality that were starkly lifted out. Uh, we look at inequality, as, as I said, poverty and inequality. We also have looked at, uh, uh, um, there's probably an unfairness uh, in that. And, and I think it's important that, that one look at those, at those two. And as a global citizen, one has to ask if that is the world that we would like to see that I referred to earlier, and we have these sort of narratives that impacted that, what is our view? What is the values that we would use to be able to shape our thinking where we would like to take uh, um, through our actions as an individual, uh, or if you want to use this, the, the term corporate citizen in a, as a collective of global citizens, where would we would like, what role would we would like to play in that corporate environment to take us through? And I think that challenges our traditional thinking of ourselves, because as a global citizen, uh, it's not global, should not be out there. Global is also how you live and where you are. So the local becomes important. And how do you then interact? So for me, it is, it is, is that understanding of yourself, that understanding of what the wider world is, uh, um, what COVID they've put on the table, and how do we reimagine uh, uh, our world, our actions, to be able to get there. And, 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 and therefore, I do think that as a disruptor, uh, COVID has, 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 has really put the whole issue of a global citizen for me on the table where, have to, where we have to reflect on ourselves. I like the um, analogy you talk about um, being here in my local, but actually the influence I can have in that bigger place when I move 
beyond where I am at the moment. So I, I quite appreciated that. Um, if we're looking at ourselves through the lens of the global citizen, what for you is the priority areas in our lives and in the way we behave and interact with each other that we would need to rethink and reimagine doing differently. And we're not talking about doing what is the one where you do the elbow greeting and instead of the handshake or the toe touching, the yeah. wahoo um, uh, greeting. We're not talking more about that. We're talking more about how are we going to think about interacting with each other when we come out of the lockdown environment and when we look forward as an individual, as the corporate citizen, as this sort of global citizen. Mm. How should we be thinking in this more sustainable, more green, more um, bigger picture place than we might have done a year ago? Yeah. So, so, so when we have an understanding of what the wider world is about and what are the particular issues that plays out, and we have got an, an, an imagination or reimagination what this world of us should be, uh, um, then I think it is, how do you actually bring those two together? Um, and for me, it, 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 it starts also with who, who I am. Uh, and that's the reason why your, fir your first question was, a, or your earlier question was a, a very relevant question, to ask your identity, who, I, who am I in that specific, uh, uh, that specific co context? And therefore, we have to talk about values. Um, so what values do I exhibit in that context? Uh, um, and and if, if we have issues like social justice, uh, fairness, uh, um, uh, equality, uh, striving towards equality, then I think if those values come to the fore, then uh, um, you would know what is the right thing or you would know what the right thing to do would be. Uh, and I think there is where we probably will have to start. Uh, what are the right things that we need to do? Uh, um, and then push that either from an individual perspective as a global citizen, or as I indicated earlier, as a collective in an organization, as a corporate citizen. Because in a corporate, you perhaps will ask uh, um, uh, what is important for, for uh, you know, I think the, the question that you probably would ask in a corporate would be, uh, um, how can I do good while I'm doing business? Now, that would mean about the business is all about value creation. So you're probably perhaps going to say as a shareholder, I would like to say the shareholder owns the business. Then there are the stakeholders. And the stakeholders for me are partners in the business. And what COVID-19 have demonstrated, maybe that partnership should be a co-created partnership. And then the employees are the business. Now, if you, if you look at value again in that concept in doing good while doing business in terms of a fairer world, then I think there is different expectations from each of those uh, in, in business itself. But again, it comes back to the individual. So I would think that for me, as a, as a priority is to reflect on who you are, to reflect on how would you imagine this fairer world, this better world, and how do we start to action that in the environment where I am? And that for me would be the sort of three things that I that I would uh, would start off with, uh, Sharon. Thanks very much, Francis. Um, when we talk about what are the right things to do, uh, the world is very green at the moment. Um, the pandemic has made us think green, register that our planet has been able to heal in certain aspects. Where do you think the corporate citizen globally particularly if you look at the students of the um, university, where can they play their part in that well-being of the individual, but the well-being of our planet at the same time? Yeah. So, so when we talk about the wider world, uh, it's, it's, it's not going to be only about uh, um, the, the, the human being uh, per se. So am I treated fair? Am I treated socially just? It's also about the natural world. Um, and, 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 and for me, that interrelationship uh, um, is immensely crucial. Um, so we need to have an understanding of what is fair towards our planet. 
um, and if we ask that question, what is fair towards our planet, that obviously speaks to the sustainability argument. So when we talk about, uh, and I want to use uh, the example within the context of COVID-19, uh, which is um, public health. Now, uh, you know, you could, you could say, uh, and, and there have been question marks, uh, specifically also in developed countries, whether the response in COVID-19 hasn't been a fragmented response uh, uh, um, rather than a consolidated response. And you perhaps would, would, would argue that where you, and in fact, yesterday we celebrated Africa Day, uh, where you have uh, um, uh, countries in the underdeveloped world or developing world um, where, where, where they potentially in Africa, where there had been experiences with Ebola, uh, uh, um, that, that, that the YAL system there was a little bit more coordinated in terms of the response, the communication that goes with that and so on. So I think the, the public health would be a crucial one. And to what extent do we focus on the preparedness uh, in terms of, of future breaks out um, and also what those responses would be. And that responses include communication uh, amongst one another. Uh, um, and I would, I would think global citizens would be, would be part of that question because they're going to, they're going to ask the question whether the World Health Organization is operating at the level that they should. Should, should there be reform, uh, for instance, taking place in the WHO, as with any other of the uh, of the global institutions, which I wouldn't go on now, but but because then the then the discussion would become a little bit more political. But that, for instance, is one. But it, 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 we should look at the same with climate change. I think the pandemic it also demonstrated there is a there is a, a collaborative a solidarity type of approach that we need to happen. So I do think that uh, um, within the organisations and within the corporates, um, employees uh, and 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 our students that we now training across the globe and also at the University of the Free State will be entering those multinationals uh, uh, organisations, and they will be trained. Uh, with that sort of curiosity, critical questioning, and, and, and also hopefully with a, a very high level of responsiveness to not only as individuals challenge that, but to challenge the, com the companies to say, well, how is our biodiversity strategy? How is our strategy on, on climate change? What are we doing on energy transition? All of those questions. And that is, I think, where the role uh, Sharon, uh, um, of industry, private sector and commerce become so crucial in the education component as well. Mm -hmm. That leads me very nicely onto a question about resources that we as an individual and as a global citizen can have more influence in the decisions we make as individuals. So collectively, um, that starts to influence, uh, you were talking about boards, board decisions, organizations doing the right thing for our planet and things like how do we use our own resources um, how do we use our energy how do we shop you know, how do we heat our homes you know, mm. how do we do a lot of these basic things that we've done in a certain way Africa's got a journey to go on some of those um, uh, choices from a planet perspective but do you think that these the, the growth of the um, global citizen will be enhanced by giving them more choices themselves? Um, Sharon, I, I think I would like to respond to that question uh, um, by, by probably prefacing the fact that um, to, maybe, to be able to make choices, you have to understand on what are you making the choices? What is the basis of making those decisions? And it's coming back to my first uh, um, in, you know, articulation of how I understand global citizen is the awareness and the understanding of the wider world. Now, if, if, if you don't have that, then to make your own choices uh, um, is gonna be emotional. Um, you know, and, and I think uh, probably if you look even before COVID, we had the whole issue of populism and, 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 and those type of things that drive the agenda. In fact, they probably have win the public argument at that point. 
but but I think if you if you make choices, it should be informed choices. And and for me, the role that educational institutions such as universities are playing uh, and should be playing is effectively to help our global citizens to be able to make those informed choices. And therefore, we need to question the way in which we tackle our curricula. Uh, um, to what extent do our curricula inform uh, uh, um, the basis of those choices? Uh, what we do in our not only formal curriculum, but also co-curricular activities uh, to be able to shape and critically uh, question and, and develop the minds of our students, um, but also to bring the private sector industry, commerce, and, and also government for that matter, onto our campuses so that our students are familiar with what are the challenges that those entities are sitting with and what are the progression that they actually have done in those spaces. Because, you know, it's not just a uh, um, a one, you know, a zero or uh, or a one answer. As you know, in 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 the corporate environment, uh, um, there is a lot of 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 things that you have to keep in mind to be able to exercise your choice. Uh, but nevertheless, is that in the implementation that goes with that is quite challenging. So for me to bring that onto our campuses, so that we really develop a global citizen. So when they get into uh, uh, um, into organizations or where they will work, they have an understanding, first of all, they have, they can get, make an informed choice and they would know how to responsibly uh, exercise their choice in the context in which they operate. Uh, so that, that, that for me is probably the critical substance of, 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 of what I would say uh, uh, choices and how choices should be, should be exercised. That leads me on to a, um, a fairly aligned topic to what you've just been talking about, is um, within the business and the corporate world, how can they support you? What do you as a university want from the corporate world? Let's take it within the context of South Africa. What do you want them to do that's going to help you deliver these uh, global citizens out of your university? Yeah. So Sharon, I, I want to go back to uh, um, uh, the the sort of explanation of how I understand business and how uh, you run a business and also doing good while you're running the business. And I refer to the shareholder, the stakeholder, and the employees. That for me is a is is a sort of the ecosystem of a business. Uh, um, and you can define what those lists of stakeholders are. I would think the communities are probably quite high in that, in that list, but so would be government. So is the university. So the, the one thing that I am also passionate about beside the global citizen, it, it is to bring across that the university exists in the ecosystem. And the ecosystem, part of that ecosystem are the industry, the uh, uh, um, uh, commerce, the private sector, government, our communities. And my, my drive is to see to what extent that ecosystem and those discrete partners, if I can put it that way, can seamlessly interface. So I want to, I want to cite you uh, two examples that we are doing at the University of the Free State. So at the University of the Free State, we have introduced the whole concept of advisory boards in our academic departments. And that is to bring those sectors of the economy that are industry, private sector and commerce much closer so that they understand what's in the curriculum that they can advise and, uh, and, and the academics can also get much more closer exposure. And that already have made a huge difference in terms of the understanding between the two sectors, which I think should be seamlessly interfaced anyway. The second part is the part of employability. Now, people would argue in South African context, and I, it might be similar in other parts of the globe, that industries in South Africa would say, universities are not producing uh, graduates that can go into the industry and immediately start working. Uh, 
Now, uh, um, and therefore there's a disconnect between what we deliver and what the, the market wants. My response is that, but the university's role really is effectively to produce global citizens that are critical thinkers, people that can adapt, people that are more creative, and they should be able to adapt fully, but that the industry should still play a role in making sure that they are industry fit, so to speak. But what we've done, at, 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 and we're piloting that at the moment at the University of Free State, is to say, okay, let's bring those industry partners in, and we're trying to do that in the tech, technology environment, computer science and technology, and we bring some of those industry representatives, and they now co-developed courses with our academics, bring some of those industry type of requirements in, but they can also co-teach with some of those academics. And therefore, we bring the employability characteristics a little bit closer into, into the curriculum um, and get that interface, that transfer between, say, the university output and the industry better. But those are examples. So for me, I can't see any university operating without that close-knitted ecosystem and the industry, private sector, and commerce, the other stakeholders as well, but those three are critical in that ecosystem. And we need to, we need to find more ways of, 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 of making that type of relationship stronger, because I think that can just benefit uh, not only from the global citizen uh, uh, discussion, but for global economics uh, and, the, and, 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 and the, the benefits that industries or large multinational corporations or corporations itself, which might not be nationals, but be our national corporations that they could benefit from. Something you said there a moment ago uh, led me to think of one of the most important um, uh, facets that companies, corporates globally are looking for in either their board directors, their executive management, or in heads of departments or countries, or wherever they've got their senior people, is the ability to adapt to change. So it's, mm. Can they be transformational as a leader? Can they help support others to go through change? But equally, how resilient and how agile are they individually and as a collective executive team or as a board, for example. And how do you think knitting into that demand of the new business world for that agility and for that ability to accept the change is now the norm. It's not just something that surprises us mm. every now and then. Uh, and all that's happening in terms of changes is just getting faster, but that these yeah. things are happening. How do you think a global citizen could support accelerating this adaptability and agility to change? Yeah. So, so if we talk about the global citizen, we talk about the attributes that they that they will have to exhibit, but that that, that they will have to to be trained or adapt or absorb while they are at a university, but also getting it from both the curricular and the co-curricular activities, and hopefully with with the interface from the different sectors of the economy. So, I do think that that should be. Uh, first of all, a critical component of the graduate attribute of our graduates leaving the universities uh, and enter the economy. So that's the first part uh, that needs to be part. And if you if you are successful in that, you would you would you would you would create a a future employee that first of all is aware. Of, uh, of, the, of the broader surroundings, uh, um, would be able to be clear on what the individual wants. And secondly, would bring in um, a critical inquiring mind. Uh, um, and, 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 and that for me is, is, is quite crucial. Uh, if, you, if you then couple, and that is what we, most universities and certainly some universities in South Africa is doing, is to say, what, what is the future world of work actually asking us uh, and from our graduates? And, and, and I think uh, um, in my conversation, and last year I had interviews or engagement with about 20 CEOs around the world to try to say, how would you reimagine your business and tell us so that we can share things. And one of the things, uh, uh, one of the CEOs uh, um, of one multinational said that, 
uh, Francis, you need to look at the work. The work has changed. The workplace has changed. And then the skill set has changed. So if you can answer those three things in your graduate attributes, you're going you're gonna to be able to respond to the exact question, Sharon, that you are asking. And that, and that is exactly what we're trying to do. Now, we can't do that alone. And that's the reason why that ecosystem is so crucial to interface. And that is what I think uh, is necessary to be able to generate future employees that are adapt adaptive, that are adaptable, uh, or not adaptable, but adaptive, uh, uh, that, that can be critically thinkers or critical thinkers, uh, that can be creative, uh, that can drive innovation, um, that can work together in groups, uh, uh, can work remotely, and also can work uh, uh, on site because the workplace also has changed. And that is in fact, if you start to tick all of those boxes, you're getting closer to that ideal global solution that I described in my opening remarks. In the process, you've just made reference to um, international global companies. Uh, one of the things that um, happens in many countries, emerging countries is that the elite, the affordable, those who've had the exposure themselves might send their children to universities outside of the home country, which is, happens in many, many emerging uh, mm -hmm. environments, including South Africa. Obviously not all students have that opportunity. What does the university in its global citizenship program and in the, the way you are thinking, how does that bring in international alumni, bring in the international um, learning to complement what's happening within country so that you can be the best for the student. Yeah. So, so your question actually touches on, on something that, that, that we are embarking at the moment on. And I think most universities, not only in South Africa, actually, around the globe should be considering. And that is, to what extent has COVID disrupted internationalization? Uh, um, uh, you know, in the UK, if I talk to vice chancellors in the UK and perhaps in Australia as well, um, the whole issue of mobility of international students and how they impact their financial models has been a, a hot topic. And I've been engaging with a lot of some of those vice chancellors there. But for me, it's an opportunity, actually, uh, up until before COVID, internationalization was really focused on mobility. So how do you transfer a researcher, a student to another university? Uh, um, and, and perhaps now also, you know, to another company in a, in a, in a uh, or a subsidiary of a company or uh, a branch of a company in another country. It was all about mobility uh, and physical transfer. The, the technology has moved uh, so, you know, where you said you can be anywhere in the world at the moment, uh, uh, Sharon, uh, engaging with me and have this conversation. But the question that we reflected on at the University of Research, so what does it actually mean for internationalization at the university? So to what extent can we have uh, uh, um, uh, supervisors for our, our postgraduate students that could be around the world? They don't need to physically relocate. They don't need to be physically at the campus. They can co-supervise students. To what extent do we have virtual coffees with postgraduate students in the UK, America, and Australia? We just have to get the times right. Uh, uh, but you have postgraduate students that engage with one another. And, and the global citizens must have the ability, which I haven't actually talked about earlier, to transcend culture, transcend countries, uh, probably transcend the politics of division as well, if you want to put that in. But, but so that's the one part. But the other beauty, and, and I talked uh, at, at, for, at Fora yesterday about uh, on Africa Day, I said that the fact that you now can have scholars and professors on the continent that can, te can teach about Africa, can look at knowledge coming from the continent that could supplement, complement, add value and enrich curricula in the global north is possible. We can have, that person doesn't have to, 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 to either relocate or to, or to travel. And that is for me, 
where I think uh, uh, um, internationalization uh, um, is going to be going. And, 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 and for me, that is exactly what, how and we practice at the University of the Free State. Not a lot of those strategies are, already has been implemented, but we will, we will work fast to get that implemented. So that we always have had a, 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 a notion of internationalization at home. Uh, so to what extent do you create that? But now we can look at internationally totally transformed in our curricula, adding to the body of knowledge globally, participate with other cultures and international scholars around the world. And, 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 and maybe even, because that is some discussions that I have with some universities in the UK at the moment, is to say, is there courses that we co-develop uh, and then co-present uh, to, to a certain extent between, say, South Africa or the African continent and, and, and in universities in the UK, or for that matter, in other parts of the globe. So I see an exciting, innovative space uh, um, in internationalization in relation to universities and science councils, but I also see the same at, uh, um, at, at, at uh, happening in private sector and the industry and commerce, because uh, in my conversation with one of the CEOs that is the CEO of a multinational, uh, um, he indicated to me that you now have a project uh, um, that people from all around the world is working on that project. Uh, um, you know, whether the person sits in Australia or in Canada or in South Africa, um, it might have been in the past where there, there, there always was a notion to see how we can bring those groups together. Now it's virtual, and 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 it, it, it's just uh, they, so they also they also learning and also practicing. Now I said to that particular CEO. Why should you keep that learning for yourself Why, or within the company? Why don't we share that uh, also with universities? And you might see universities as other institutions. I see them the same. I see that uh, they might just have a different mandate, but they're in the same ecosystem. So let us learn from one another. But that's an exciting space, uh, um, a reimagining. I use the word reimagining quite a bit, but reimagining uh, um, internationalization going forward and the role of the global citizen within that. Question from the floor that links directly to what you've just been talking about. Um, for this globalization that has occurred, this new online world that we have very um, seamlessly adapted to, to what degree does that allow the university to offer its message much more globally, as you were talking about a few moments ago? But the other aspect of it is, do you get a different student profile? Do you get much younger students, much older students? Uh, do you get them from many, many different cultures and countries? Um, and the other aspect linking to that is, has that changed your business model in terms of pricing for those students? Because they're not physically in your space, they're not occupying the same resources. So how's the business model supporting the university delivering to the global citizen? Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a very, very good question. And, and as I said, we, we at the moment developing that. So we, we're not at that, at that uh, uh, I would say, uh, state uh, um, where we say we could steady state and that is how we operate. But those are the questions that we are asking at the moment. So at the University of the Free State, we always had uh, um, a... Uh, an online offering, but those were effectively for more senior students, more uh, um, uh, students that were more, uh, older than say 25 years old. Um, and, 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 and we have a certain price structure that we had and that some of those were offered to other parts on the continent as well, not only in South Africa. So we're familiar with that, but the fact that you now um, could even offer modules that uh, um, that are um, that are sort of co-taught uh, between South Africa, our, our university, and other parts of the globe. Uh, um, that surely is going to look at, at, at is going to impact your price structure. So I I haven't got a an, an, an specific answer. The only answer that I could say is that that is some of the aspects that we are, are unpacking at the moment. The the move to towards uh, utilizing fully the online or digital space 
haven't resulted as yet, um, because that's quite too early, haven't as yet resulted in a change in our demographic profile. But I'm pretty sure that if we embark on a, a very aggressive approach towards internationalization and also lift out the uniqueness that we could offer in that internationalization strategy, that definitely will, will impact it. And then we will have to look at, at price structure. Uh, the business model uh, um, will be very much informed. We've now uh, just uh, going through our final stages of delivering a digital teaching and learning strategy. Uh, um, and I think the, the, the implementation of that will very much inform uh, um, how we practice uh, and how the business model of offering that. Just an example, a very quick example on that. Uh, in, in, the, in, one of, in the executive committee meeting this morning, uh, we, were, we were debating the, um, the increase in, um, in pass rates of, uh, of students uh, um, in tests and also to the end of last year. Generally in South Africa, the pass rate has gone up. Now the question is, is that real? Uh, is there... Is there uh, something that we should be looking out for in terms of the online environment that may be our assessment and the way that we check uh, uh, um, honesty and all of those things that comes with that? Is that fully? So, so it's a very, it's a very uh, um, important question to ask from that context, but that surely will, it will inform us how that business model ultimately, not only financially, but also the way in which we practice will be operating. So it's a new it's a new area, but it's an area that we we are currently embarking on. Uh, um, yes, yes, I'm live. Um, yeah. Just a, a question that you can't go through speaking in an African context without linking what you're talking about as the global citizen to Ubuntu. Mm. We are because we are, or something quite similar to that. Yeah. yeah. Um, how does Ubuntu, the corporate structure, and the global citizen is, is there a is there a link in that process somewhere? Uh, what is how does that link into the Ubuntu concept, which is very powerful in Africa? Yeah. So the Ubuntu concept, um, uh, and you know, there's 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 different ways in how you can explain it, but for me, the Ubuntu uh, concept characterizes uh, um, also a level of solidarity uh, mm -hmm. of knowing who you are and knowing what you want to do to be also make others and build others up uh, uh, um, in in whatever context they are so it is it is that is your relationship to another human being and human beings if you look at the at the collective in to uh, uh, um, to, to, to doing good as well, because that's part of the, of the equation. So for me, the solidarity aspect is, is, um, is quite crucial because as a global citizen, we talk to the individual, um, to be able to make impact, you will have to move to the collective. Uh, and, 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 uh, and I think as we move to the collective, how do we, with a Ubuntu concept, transfer that sort of values or value system that that do good uh, um, and that is also learning from the past which we uh, uh, which which might not have been that great uh, to say well let us not do the same mistakes again um, you know and I think the climate change the climate change scenario should also learn from the public health and vice versa. Uh, and and, and, and that's, that's how the Ubuntu global citizenship for me in global linked. But also, if you then talk about the collective, that is what you would experience in a corporate environment. And for me, uh, um, if, if we have that collective in a corporate environment, to what extent do you responsibly start to mobilize that collective towards doing good while doing business and making sure that the company, the value creation underpinned by the interrelationship between the human and the natural world is actually creating value for the shareholder, the employee, as well as for all the stakeholders, all building towards a better world. I think you muted, uh, Sharon. 
didn't successfully unmute that one without <laughs> checking I'd done it properly. Um, in the what you've just been saying there now makes me think of King Four, which is your governance code, where they have now the requirement for an ethics committee, mm. and they talk about the responsibility of the corporate citizen and um, the ethics of the individuals within it and its behaviour to stakeholders. So very correlating to what you were talking about a moment ago. But a different question that's come forward is historically pandemics have occurred some worse than the ones we're in now and different behaviors uh, societal corporate individual have occurred following that and there has been there's potentially some evidence that there is periods of conflict that follow a pandemic are we so looking at COVID with rose-tinted glasses, thinking the world's going to be perfect from here on afterwards? Yeah, no, no I don't think we, we, because, you know, if you don't learn from the past, you'll never be able to say, how oh, do you navigate the future? And, and the past have indicated that that's not necessarily the case. So I do, I do think that uh, COVID-19 have given us a moment to reflect uh, and, 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 and to reflect on what need to change going forward. Now, uh, um, you know, I was I was listening to a debate earlier last year, where we talked about um, a leaderless world. Um, you know, they would talk about the G zero world, um, and the, the 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 if you if you look at where the conversation converged, it was about it is really you know a, a play between China and 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 the states, and that there aren't a third player that. That is, uh, um, that is coming up to be able to, to navigate that. Now, the question is uh, uh, COVID-19. If I now look back at that narrative or that discussion, uh, COVID-19 and the, uh, um, the, the manufacturing of vaccine, the distribution of vaccines, uh, um, the, 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 the challenge towards tackling uh, public health have probably forced or starting to force uh, the states and China to start talking to one another uh, at that level. Now, uh, um, and that, and, and I think you know, if you if you look at the at the Biden administration uh, that came in, that is exactly what what is what is trying to push the push of a more collective, connective, and coherent world. So, so I think it's important for us to uh, um, to say this is where we want to go to learn from, uh, uh, from what happened in the past. Uh, um, but I do think that there, there is enough traction happening in the world of today, uh, um, not only in the developed world, also in the developing world of to say that, listen, we will have to start to engage more meaningfully. Uh, um, we will have to start to listen to one another. An example that I cited yesterday was on the African continent, the um, the African trade agreement that came into place beginning of, of, of the year, uh, where we start to, to also get trade uh, uh, um, more uh, um, uh, accelerated amongst uh, countries in, in, in on the African continent. So I do think that there's a, there's a swing for me, uh, but you're always going to get other side, 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 side shows, so to speak, and we need to be aware. We, we shouldn't be just saying that that wouldn't happen. But I think the if we have more global citizens that argue for what is the right thing to do, that mobilization together with hopefully leaders that will come up and, 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 and say, well, this is the direction that we want to go, uh, then I think uh, we would be able to navigate ourselves. I think it's more navigation rather than to say, Everybody is going to go that that direction, but but for me the mo the mobilisation is 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 trending in the right direction. Talking about all these different people and the um, what's very um, what we're all very mindful of today is the demographic of South Africa, mm. the diversity globally, the mindfulness of inclusion of people so that we don't create um, exclusion by our behavior, not by our intention. So we've got that, that whole place of diversity. Now, how can the un university develop its global citizens that we naturally absorb this in as a way of life? Mm. So, so for me, 
uh, Sharon, the either uh, a lot of, of, of people, if they respond to the question of, you know, what the role of universities are and what is the role of university in society, um, a lot of vice chancellors would say, well, universities represent the cosmos of society. And, and I often say, I have got a different view of that. I said universities should represent what society should look like. Because if we can't impact that transformative change while people are at the university, then I, I think we, uh, we're missing the role of universities. We can't have the same society uh, um, as we have today uh, in terms of how they operate and, and so on. So we need to be able to say, how can we advance that? How can we better that? And to do that, that's a, that's a big task as a university. So uh, it's a task that, 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 again, I want to not shift the responsibility away from the university, but it's a task that I think all of the publics uh, uh, need to get involved with. Um, and, and that's the reason why we develop curricula in co-curricular programs for the other people to come in to say, well, listen, help us to get there. We're going to do all of our training, but we normally have, have about four years or five years uh, um, or six years of uh, students on the campus. And then they, then they exit campus and going into the wider world. Uh, and, 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 and for me, that conversation and universities globally are, are, are asking, are grappling with that question. What is our role in society? And because the global citizen will need to be able to affect change in society uh, uh, globally, um, it's a critical role that we need to play. So the only thing that I could say is that our programs are very much uh, um, uh, um, uh, directed to be able to deliver a graduate that, that, that can take his or her place in the global world as a global citizen. But at the same time, I would add that the university's contribution would not be enough to optimally exploit the value of that global citizen and how can the global, global citizen interface seamlessly into the world. So it's a, it's a, it's a, um, I'm not docking your question, but I think it's a, it's, it's a, uh, uh, it's a combination of efforts that needs to happen. We can do our best, but what will help is that if that ecosystem that I talked about earlier is, is also playing a role to say that our role really is to better societies. And, 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 and uh, there's, there's one company's logo that, you know, we would reimagine, uh, um, a, a, a commodity or a sector, reimagining a sector to improve the quality of life uh, of our people. And our people is not only the company itself, is the people in the world. And I think if, we, if, most, if more companies have that sort of outlook uh, and back integrate with our universities and university sector, we're going to be closely to, to answering your question in a, in a very pure, uh, honest and holistic manner. Last question, just combining a few bits and pieces of um, ideas that I've seen from the, the, the chat and from the Q&A side, is one of the aspects of globalization has been the provision of free movement for capital, mm. where capital has gone where it is able to make its um, value creation maximized. Um, along with that, globalization has brought us a high degree of labor movement. Um, you can see what Brexit's done to labor movement for the UK, for example. Um, we've had a pandemic that's locked people down globally. What is that doing to education of global citizens? What is it doing for the labor world generally? And how do you see that unlocking itself over the next couple of years as hopefully the pandemic becomes less of an issue to us? Mm. Are we going to get back to that free movement of labor again and therefore the influence of the global citizen going with that free labor movement. This will be your last question. Yeah. So well, Sharon, I, is. <laughs> yeah, okay. uh, Sharon, I probably, I probably have two responses to that question. Um, the one is hopefully, you know, as, as, as we got our, ourselves vaccinated over time, uh, um, we will start to have more, more mobility uh, um, and, and to a certain extent, the global citizen can play 
her or his role in that context. Um, and 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 but I I think we must not uh, think that uh, you know post COVID, so to speak, will be exactly the same as before COVID. So uh, companies, um, organizations have changed their business models uh, um, whilst we were in the lockdown period. Uh, and there are aspects in their changes that will be there forever. Uh, and, 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 and so if that is the case, and that was so important to have that interview with those different CEOs. So if that's the change, if that is the case, then as universities, we should also reimagine how that value of, of, of physical transfer of, through, through globalization, if that's not there anymore or to the extent of what it was in the past, how are we going to supplement that in the models that we offer? And that's been our thinking. So, so I think there need to be and that reimagination in terms of to say that there is going to be shortage. You, you might be working for a company in London, but you will be based in South Africa. Uh, um, and, 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 and you might just once every or twice a year, you might go across. But otherwise, all of your meetings are, are remote. Uh, and, and, uh, and how do you actually bring to the fore global citizenship uh, in, in that context? So that has been part of our thinking. And our models has been refined and will be we will keep on refining that to provide that deficit that uh, uh, that that would have that would have resulted in a change in the business models, even if we can travel freely uh, uh, in future. On that note, I think all of us who are South Africans globally are hankering to come back to South Africa <laughs> over some open airwaves and no red channels. And <laughs> many of us would love to have come over. I had tickets for, for the uh, Lions and now I'm sitting with them offering me my money back. Well, thank goodness, I should, I should be grateful. <laughs> but yes, I think we're all looking forward for the ability to travel. And hopefully next time I see you, we'll be in either the UK or in South in Africa, South. not in this environment. Actually, we're probably going to be in this environment first before we get further than that. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's been a very, very insightful hour. We are a few moments beyond our uh, time now, so I'm going to call it to an end. I want to thank you for your contribution, for the lovely university behind you, and for the insights you've given to us about how individuals in this new world of caring for our planet and caring for each other that we each have a role to play in that place as well. So I'd like to thank you very much. And from everyone else that is attending, really appreciate your time to all the organization that occurred behind this event starting and the three that are to follow. So we have three uh, semi-connected events that are going to occur between now and the beginning of COP26, uh, um, working with the University of the Free State. So thanks everyone for attending this uh, session and to Professor Francis Peterson, wonderful to spend time with you again. Thank you, Sharon. Appreciate your Thank time. you much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Cheers, everybody. <clears throat>